So I'm going to get the apologies out of the way up front. Uh, I thought I was going to be talking for an hour. Don't ask me why. I just thought it was. Uh, and then I checked, and it was actually for 20 minutes, plus I had to leave time for questions. So I may speak really, really quickly. If I, We have a stand right over there. If any of this sounds like it's something that actually might be interesting or you uh, want to talk to me about it, please let me know. But uh, I've already used 20 seconds of my time, so I won't spend any longer on it. Uh, but if you want to know, why did he talk so fast? It's because I've got 28 slides I've got to do in 20 minutes, which is utterly impossible, but I'm going to try. So who am I? I'm quite old. I've worked in consultancy for many years. I've worked in finance. I've worked in manufacturing, specifically for Toyota, which was maybe the hardest job I ever had. Uh, so I know a little bit about how auto manufacturing works in supply chains. But I've done payments, commodities, uh, engine health management for Rolls-Royce. You can see the details there. But the reason I give a little bit of my background is really because what I'm doing now very much reflects my experience of working in those companies, particularly what tools do they need. And I think in recent times this has become a, an extremely important point, which is that uh, it is a very, very uncertain world. So we often say that the world was pretty stable. So most lean manufacturing is based on the idea of stability or being able to influence stability and make it so that uh, you can deal with much less work in process, you can do just in time, you can do all these lovely ways of making sure that things are very, very efficient. And that has allowed our manufacturing industry to essentially become globalized. We have supply chains that are extended across the entire world, very long. We have maybe 15 or 20 steps all the way from the point where something starts life as a piece of metal or something similar and then ultimately ends up being incorporated into an assembly. The primary focus has been on efficiency more than anything else. How do we keep this low cost? How do we compete with our competitors? How do we make sure that our quality is excellent while still being low cost? And did I mention low cost? The, the, the point is that that efficiency point has been very much the focus of everything that we did in manufacturing for a very long time. The part of that low cost idea, and I just put one here, which of course everybody talks about a lot, which is inventory. The idea is that you don't have much inventory. You don't want a lot of uh, parts hanging around because parts change, in which case you've got to throw it all away. And the other is that that's considered waste. So if you're ever into lean manufacturing, we talk about mudra a lot, we talk about waste a lot, and inventory is like the cardinal sin. Then kind of things changed a little bit. We had COVID. We had somebody crashed a boat for weeks. Uh, and then, particularly in car manufacturing, there was this very strange situation where everybody shut down their car plants because they couldn't get the controller chips to put into the computers. Uh, and th literally three factories caught fire. Uh, there was a factory in China, which was the primary supplier. And they couldn't get chips on the boats anyway because the canal was blocked. And they couldn't get chips quickly on a plane because nobody was going on holiday and the cheapest way of moving things by plane was by putting it under people when they're on a plane. No planes, no, nobody put it under. It didn't kind of work. Then there was another fire in uh, Japan for uh, Renesas and they were almost exclusively su the suppliers of a particular chipset towards the car industry. And then, just to add insult to injury, we had a fire in Holland at ASML, and they build all of the uh, equipment that actually makes the chips. So you're working backwards through the supply chain, which meant that they couldn't actually, even if they rebuilt these factories that had caught fire, they couldn't actually redeploy them or put the machines in place. And that created this very difficult situation where you couldn't get stuff quickly. Unfortunately, most car manufacturers thought they weren't going to sell any cars and they'd run inventory down to almost zero. And also they were expecting electric cars and new platforms to come along, so they'd run their inventory very low. And so this combination of very low inventory and having a, not only a blocked, but a completely stalled supply chain got us into this perfect storm where they're actually uh, turning off factories. Turning off a car factory costs, I think the last thing I saw was, on average, one production line is about $15 million 
a day, sometimes an hour, depending on what sort of production line it is. So this is not something they do unless they absolutely have to. So it's a significant problem. To me, that meant we need something new. And one of the things I was talking to a customer of ours, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, and I said, what about your supply chain? Are you actually looking at the supply chain that he said, absolutely, we need to model our supply chain and his phrase, which I like very much for the chipsets, was we need to model it all the way back to sand. They were just modeling first and second line tiers of their suppliers. They realized they had another 15 uh, steps before that with suppliers, and they didn't know that. And so they were completely caught unawares. They couldn't plan strategically and actually tactically they did, all their normal options weren't available to them because they, had, they didn't have this information available to them. And what they want is this idea of managing total risk. How do I actually know what the risk is associated with any particular part in manufacturing? Or, but this applies to data operations or any operational flow. How much risk do I have associated with any part of that flow of activities? It could be a machine, it could be a route, it could be a supplier, it could be, any, it could be a report, it could be a, a CPU, it could be anything. The point is we have this incredibly complex and interlinked world of this network of way of doing things. Actually being able to calculate that total risk is something that up to now has only been, I'd only done it in finance. The other is, okay, so if we can at least understand the total risk, we need, what are we going to do about it? And that's where you get to the point of, okay, so what's the next best thing to do? How do we fix that? How do we make our network more resilient? What could we do? We don't have infinite money. We can't change everything. We, you know, we're stuck with what we've got uh, to a great extent. We can't suddenly change suppliers or suddenly change all these different things or tools or factories. Most factories are running on mainframes. You're not going to be suddenly introducing a load of technology into that space. And the other point here, which is really important because it's what goes against everything that we think about in terms of lean manufacturing is we cannot predict the future. We have fooled ourselves for many years that we can predict the future. Those things we showed earlier show that we really can't predict the future. And so now we need to have this ability to respond. And then, which brings me back to a word which is very close to my heart, <laughs> which is how do we get agility into our supply chain. In order for it to be resilient when the world is unpredictable, then it has to be agile. That is really the only thing we can do. Agility fundamentally means that when something changes that we weren't expecting, we have the ability to step sideways, we have strategies, we have responses that we can apply even when the unpredictable happens, when these black swan style events happen it really does make the difference between surviving and not surviving in a particular situation. It is not uncommon for uh, these kinds of events to be real existential threats for even very significant businesses like auto manufacturing, but I think uh, manufacturing in general, and banks and retailers if we extend the use case to all of the operational networks. So. If you start from scratch, you say, well, what does that mean? What do we need? I need to know really quickly that something's gone wrong. I need to understand what the impact of that problem is with respect to my entire network, everybody downstream. Just knowing that a machine is broken is no good to me unless I can understand what impact it's going to have on my order book or my commitments or my suppliers upstream if I decide that I can't take inventory anymore. I have to pay my supplier to keep that inventory, or I have to pay that supplier to throw away that inventory. It actually costs more to not consume something than it does to consume something when you're in a supply side situation. You need to know all of the impacts. It's no good just knowing one step of impact. You need to know all the way down long-term impacts. If I change this, then what does that have? What's the knock-on effect? You, why it happened? If, if you ever do Toyota Way stuff, they talk about five way, whys, root cause analysis, being able to understand why something went wrong in a root cause sense is very difficult and it takes a very long time to do 
properly if you don't have all the information available to you. So being able to do that very quickly helps because it means that you can find the most uh, important response, the thing that's actually going to make the biggest difference ongoing. And of course, what do you do? What are my options? This is an unpredicted event. We've never thought that this might happen. So what do we do in that situation? We need the ability to very rapidly come up with alternates. That's the tactical side. Strategically, you want to know, given my network, how risky is it? What's my highest benefit intervention, also known as the cheapest thing that will make things better? What are the minimum changes, which is very different? Uh, any change just has knock-on effects so that other things will cause to have a problem. And so the idea is to find that smallest change that's actually going to have the, the most benefit in improving your resilience or whatever metric you're trying to use. How do you make sure that the improvement is a general improvement, not just a tiny improvement in one place. The, it's an interlinked network. It may be that I make a huge improvement in one place, but then all that happens is my risk moves a very short distance downstream, and I have not really improved my risk over the global situation. And of course, show me the, show me the measure, show me the money, show me what that changes the global risk when I do it. How do I rapidly move through this? How do I go through scenarios? Again, this is all about agility, but the point is you need these tools to be able to analyze this. Human beings need to be able to do this kind of unexpected work across a massively complex network. It's just not something that human beings are very good at, and unfortunately the tools haven't necessarily helped. Current systems, they're designed for lean. MRP, MRP2, ERP, all these things, they're designed for a lean, efficient world, stable world. They're not designed for massive interventions and massive changes. Usually, they deal with very small changes. They're usually siloed by function. So you'll have procurement, you'll have uh, strategic planning, you'll have manufacturing, you'll have all these different areas that are uh, logistics. And they generally, even though they are coordinated, it, that is not done in an automated way, they each have their own little data silos, and then they usually share data by spreadsheet. Again, that's not going to help you if you need to change things quickly across an entire network. Even if you do have a good model, and there are many large-scale ERP systems that can model a huge amount of your factory, the difficulty is that they can't actually analyze that information. They can merely present it. And this is a situation where you need to be able to analyze. This is where digital twins come in, finally. And I need to start moving quickly. What's a digital twin? It's just a flow of processes through a network when it's an operational digital twin. Old school digital twins modeled a single machine. New school, it's modeling the entire network. And the great thing is that we already know how to do this in a human way, because we're talking about human-centric approaches here. We have diagrams. And uh, the network is embedded in a context, which it should say the landscape, and that's my one typo. And, uh, but diagrams, we've had these. Here's one from the late 1600s. It's a brewery. Uh, not surprisingly, this was probably some of the original diagrams for process flows, was looking at breweries and how they can go from ingredients on the left to beer on the right. Very low margin business, very high turnaround, very heavily affected by things that can't be predicted, like what's my harvest like this year for hops? Where am I going to get my stuff from? It's actually a remarkably stressful business, the beer guy or food manufacturing, any fast-moving good. Uh, we have one of our best customers is Unilever for exactly this reason, is they care deeply about where they're going to get their next batch of chemicals from so that they can produce these millions of tons of commodities that they actually have to push out to supermarkets on a daily basis. The great thing about diagrams is it's a common physical representation. And what that means is that everybody understands it. We're human-centric in this point. We need people, assist people in their strategies and in their responses. It is a network, which, because I sell graph databases, which is really just a, ne data, a network database. Uh, it's uh, something that I can affect, I can improve. and. It describes the real-time situation in that contextual way that we want. I love this picture. Effectively, if we look at what we want, it's on the left. We want to have something that looks like the world that we care about. 
what we have in our current data systems usually looks a bit more on the right. Individually elements, perfectly ordered, beautifully organized, but also completely unrepresentative and not, not common across the various silos. And that is where, where all of the delays happen when you're trying to make a response. We don't want this. What we want is this. We want a connected world. I'm going to go into some examples quickly. And I know that my friend here is going to say, there'll be no time for questions. We have a stand right over there. So if you have got any questions, I'll be there. Please come and talk to me. I've even got the, some of the live demos that I'm showing here I can show you live. Um, Plexigrid, what they do is they create a digital twin of an entire country electrical network. It's detailed down to the individual component level. It's got real-time data for operational monitoring, root cause analysis, simulating future scenarios, and it deals with constant change. And what they chose was a graph database. They chose our graph database. They chose it because they could do these analytics constantly. Every, I think it's every 20 seconds, they're running against the entire network to work out whether actually they've got a problem or not, and whether they need to make recommendations. And it's beautiful. It shows exactly what people expect. Show me where the problems are physically, because this is a physical problem. Show me where the issues are. Then show me the problems in that context. And so you've got this contextual view, which people can share around. They can send to people. Everybody understands it, from engineering all the way up to the top level, with histories and simulations and all that nice stuff that is allowing the human beings to look at the data. So for example, you can see there's a, well, see if this works. There's a, that spike there. Is that significant or is it not? Maybe it's not. Maybe you don't need to do anything today, but somebody else might look at that and go, yeah, but that might happen again. Maybe I do need to worry about that for the future. It doesn't have to be a very physical view. This logical view, if you're in manufacturing, then this kind of view is very common, particularly for bills and materials. And this is what you want, is you have that ability to take the messy physical view, take all of that, and then re-show it again in a way that actually makes sense, that allows you to effectively share it with other people and look at the network in terms of improvement. It doesn't have to be electrical networks. This is my uh, demo for data operations. This, and just to get, show you how this works, it's really simple. Why? Why did something break? What do you want to see? You want to see the entire upstream causation. So if you've got a problem, somebody says, where is my report? Where is my number? Where is my part? Then you, just, you need to be able to see the entire line upstream. So this is done immediately in real time. It, it's much sexier if I do it in front of you, but uh, believe me that this is something where you can just roll over and see it. You need to see the total impact view. What are all the things that are affected by a particular problem? And particularly, and we did this for Sainsbury's, who are a very large retail outlet, I said the way that we sold it to them was I said, this tells you who you need to ring so that when the newspapers ring up and say, why are you, you, know, why are you broken, they, you have that information. It allows people to sleep at night knowing that if something does go wrong, they will be able to explain what the problem is. They will be able to actually do something about it, which is tremendously useful. And then finally, we talked about the total risk view, same representation, but now what we're doing is we're decorating it with a, these are the areas where you need to understand that there is a likely to be a problem. This is your bottleneck. These are the areas where you might want to make an intervention in order to improve the situation later. Of course, my pretty one isn't the real one. That's kind of their real data network. That's a tiny portion of a massive picture they have over a million data flow activities running in any one day. They have anything up to 5% of them are broken. They're doing a transformation where they're moving everything onto Snowflake. Hi, Snowflake. Uh, so the ch amount of change they're dealing with is enormous. The only way they can do that is by having this ability to very rapidly understand impact. And so what they need is this real-time analytic graph database. And this is my last slide. So I've got. 40 seconds for questions. How's that? Oh, it's not five minutes. I'm so sorry. But if anybody does have questions, maybe I can probably do one question or two questions. And obviously, you know where I am. Then uh, please let me know. Hello. This was fantastic. You did it.